silence so it doesn't ring at the wrong time. Fantastic. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Today we're talking about warehouse management. We know how important warehouse management can be. It can save the business a lot of money if effectively run. Today we have another webinar series in our series with, Proc with Procter & Gamble, South Africa. Uh, we're very excited to have Harshal Harkinson to speak to us about warehouse management. Harshal is the Associate Director looking after Southern Africa supply chain. He has a lot of experience at PNG, especially around warehousing. If I can just go to a bit of housekeeping, we'd really appreciate it if everybody joined could go on mute. I know most of you now who've joined have gone on mute. Uh, we'd like you to ask your questions on the chat box and we are going to stop in the presentation to pick up the questions. So please, as you think of your questions, please do type them in the chat box and we'll make sure that we, we cover the questions effectively. And with that, I'm going to ask Harshal to take us through the presentation. So thank you so much for your time, Harshal, and over to you. Hey, Jean, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. So uh, it's an absolute pleasure being here today with you uh, to spend some time just sharing some of the knowledge I have. Uh, let me just give you a brief introduction of who I am. So I've been with PNG now almost 18 years uh, as of August. Uh, I am married uh, a South African. Uh, I stayed in Johannesburg and I've been living all my life in Johannesburg. I've been fortunate enough uh, to be with PNG for that many years and have been able to go through a number of assignments from planning to logistics management to business planning to managing Africa for a while. Uh, and I've been an integral part of thinking about how we do go to market, how we set up distributors, how I've been part of the team that has also changed uh, warehouse partners. So I, I've been fortunate enough to be able to work with PNG and go through all of these uh, various assignments, I would say, over the last 18 years. Uh, and today is really about the time we're going to spend just to bring you, grounding you on what are the important elements of warehousing. Once we have that clarity, we're going to pause. I'd like to get your questions. We're going to then continue on what are some of the key standards? Uh, what do you need to do as you think about your warehousing? And then we'll also talk towards the end of the day, just a bit of an update on what are those core keep in process measures that you have to be tracking and monitoring as you think about your warehouse? And what is the best methodology around to help you drive cost out of the system and then to drive efficiencies in your warehouse? So with that, thanks. walking off the, the warehouse principles. And then as we go through, please feel free to drop the questions. And as we do have that session for Q&A, happy to answer them. If I don't know, uh, I will definitely come back to anyone on the call. Let's start uh, with the operations. Uh, I think today I wanted to give you a quick overview. And many of you who have your DC operations, they, they are two or three big pillars in any uh, supply chain. One is the inbound flow, the second is storage and order preparation, and the third is the outbound. Okay, And as you think about inbound, depending on where you're sourcing your product, uh, there are a few key components that you always need to take into account, whether you're going to bring it up by road, whether it's going to be on rail, are you producing it locally, are you importing it, where are you importing it, that's some critical elements that you always need to take into account as you think about inbound flow. The second part and the big part is where do you store your product? How far is it from the center of gravity to all of the customers you service? And then how do you prepare those orders before they go outbound? Okay. Uh, and our warehouses all have a security checkpoint. And as many of you would know, your truck would arrive. It should go through the security checkpoint once it's ready. It then gets beamed off into an, a queue of where it's going to be offloaded. Okay, and this is quite important because the flow of how your product comes in and out has a huge impact on how and where you spend your cost. 
definitely you're going to have someone that's going to flag them and tell them exactly which store to go to, how to, or which, which aisle to offload, or where do they have to park until the vehicle is ready to offload. Once you're ready, it goes to a parking bay, and then it goes to a dock tour. Now, this is not a dock tour you would see in South Africa, but it's the principle is important. You have to give clarity to whoever's offload your vehicle where you need to go because that's where your resources are going to be waiting for them to offload those trucks. They'll get notification of, course, of where those trucks are and so that at least the driver knows exactly how long and for how much of time he's going to be spending on your site. Okay. Once they're ready, they go straight to the door that's designated for them and they're ready now for offloading. Now, as you think about it, this unloading process is a critical process because you want to make sure that you have the right staffing at the time of unloading ahead of it getting put into your DC. Once it's obviously the product, you have a fixed product, moves it to the staging area. Once it's at staging, it's you're gonna have someone or someone in your organization ready to go and validate that whatever was on the truck is exactly what was offloaded. And usually what you find in normally in very big warehouses, they always have a staging area. One is to make sure that the product is offloaded is correct. Any damages and misses are quantified and calibrated at the point of time when they are offloaded. And to make sure that before you go and put it into an or flow storage, you are clear exactly where it should go. Okay. In Houses that are a bit more sophisticated, you will be scanning. In some houses, you may not have that luxury, but be it as it may, the important thing is to note exactly what you received and how much you received. Okay. Many of you may have seen this type of label. This is a unique label that big warehouse management systems utilize to tell the driver or the person what did they offload. How much did they offload? What's the expiry date of that of uh, that product? And what's the quantity? And also, if it needs to go into quality or not to go into quality, depending on the type of product you are serving, servicing your consumers. Okay. Once it's ready, it's ready to be put up, gets taken into the racks, and now you ready your product into your rack. Okay, and this is the typical inbound flow you would see in pretty much most warehouse uh, um, operations today. It's just the this, this steps that every single warehouse, independent on how sophisticated they are, they will have some of these steps involved. Once it's in storage, first, um, then what's also easy to understand okay, how many coverage does this one pallet or the product that you have sitting in your warehouse cover in terms of your sellout. As you think about it, once it's stored, the next thing you're going to wait for is order processing. And order we usually start at six o'clock, depending on the system that you're utilizing in PNG, where you're using SAP, the orders get downloaded. But once they get downloaded, at the point of download, all the stock validation is being checked. So if the customer ordered 100, are they able to be serviced at 100% full rate? If not, what are you cutting? Why are you cutting? And then that is the communication you would want to flow back to your customer to make sure that they're clear on based on the orders they place, what will they not be able to get? Once you have the orders in your order well and ready for to go into your DC, you would want to understand how many of those orders are full pallets, how many are non-full pallets. Once that's available, that information goes to your warehousing team to be to pick. Okay, and the picking usually quickly depending on the size of the orders. We have some orders that start off uh, can take us up to 24 hours. Some can do take us 48 hours, depending on the complexity of that order you would have to go and pick into your DC to make sure that you can replenish that order. And once it's available, the product should be able to be moved and be ready for picking. And that should be the full cycle of your order processing for one order, okay? There are certain individuals in your warehouse that are going to go through the warehouse to make sure the right product for that order in question. Okay, so we 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 
we just spent a few minutes on the order cycle, processing cycle in the warehouse. And spent a bit more time of, okay, once I have that order, what is the flow? Okay, and ideally you want it to be in a U shape or in a snake shape so that you don't have in your warehouse as you to pick the order. Ideally you want to have those orders put on a pallet and then as they're ready, to make sure Sorry, that, they, that when it, yeah, sure. Um, your system was starting to go in and out. You may have to go off video to just allow better system. Sure. Um, thanks. Yeah, sure. Let me do that. Hopefully that is better. Uh, should I go back and just explain maybe just a, just a few minutes? So, uh, the in the in the most efficient way. And usually what you find is that that you may want an idea of a way which is one either one that is willing to do much to process that order because that all of that information it can be utilized and have been identified as losses in your picking process. You have all the completed you should have a palette that looks something similar to this this is a savage palette where you've been able to stack the heaviest items at the bottom and then you progress up and you blow the rest of the products this would be a typical standard you find in south africa depending on the retailer you supply and how they would prefer that you deliver to them what you usually find is in most warehouses if they have a racked a warehousing system they're going to focus on making sure that if there has a scanner and there's a big uh, big base that they need to go to they're going to first go to the cell which we call the location to go and identify okay where is this pallet once they've identified this pallet they're going to scan and make sure that they're the right pallet they scan all the cases scan the quality Slightly, once they've picked it, they're going to put it on. They will follow this red box with a smiley face on it because that's the box that we're trying to move through our entire supply chain. As you think about it, what's important is also the last part of the six process uh, step for pick. We'll talk about it later in this in the session, but count back is really about making sure that if someone goes to a pallet location or a location and they've picked a product out of it, they should always go at that same point in time and count what is left behind because that's one way of making sure you manage your inventory and making sure that you're counting and dealt whatever is left in the big phase or in the location is the correct amount. And then last but next, they're going to move to the next cell to complete the picking process. Then once all of that picking is ready, you're going to give me, well, you're going to consolidate all of your pool pallets and all of your mixed pallets. The idea is to get them isolated into one area so that as you order, whoever is checking that final order is able to say, okay, with certainty, we we'll pick the right quantity, it's available at the right in the right area so that you make sure that before it gets loaded, you've done all the relevant checks for the smooth flowing of those orders. Okay. Once it's ready, it should be loaded into a truck. Uh, depending on the type of equipment you have, you could sandwich pallets, you could have doubles. But the idea is to always maximize your truck flow rates as you ship out and as you ship in, because all of those have a significant on the cost of your transportation. Because what you don't want to do is be shipping A. And A is probably the most expensive thing to keep available in any vehicle, whether it be on your inbound leg or on your outbound leg. And so once it's loaded, it's already been pulled off. Someone that's confirmed that that truck has been loaded validation of the load has taken place called off and ready to leave your site okay. so, that you 
should see. Okay, and I'm going to pause now to see if there's any questions, Gene, so that we can answer them before we go into the standards and before we go into the key KPIs that we want to review. Yeah, um, your sound is still a bit wobbly. I mean, I, I'm able to follow you, especially because the pictures are so informative. Um, and I don't know, is your cell phone on? Maybe you may need to put your cell phone on um, uh, flight mode. We're just getting, it's, it's blocking every, a little bit here and there. In terms of the questions, we just needed a clarification of staging and DC. You talked about DC system and staging, just a quick clarification of that. DC stands for distribution center. So let's get the, that's just an acronym. So good that uh, people are just stopping and pausing to validate the acronym. Gina, is this any better as I speak? Yeah, it's sounding better at the moment. Yes. Okay. So that's just to explain DC just stands for distribution center. Okay. As you think about it, a staging area is, let's just go back. at this point to a staging area is basically inventory that you have not counted or you're not ready to put away but you need to keep it in a in an isolated area so that before you can tell someone to move it to a specific location it is basically in the staging area and the idea of a staging area is just to manage the flow and to manage your workforce because what you want to do is you want to move your workforce to where the work is so you don't want to have to have any idle people. So ideally what you could have is the same person or the same group of individuals that is managing the offloading okay, and checking and validation in the staging area are the very same people that would go and put it away into your DC, depending on the type of DC you have, where it's for storage or whether you have it in a rack. You want to utilize those people so they flow to the work and not the other way around, so that you always have people that are fully utilized. Okay. I hope that and then the, the yeah, that was great. Um, the other one was, around, um, I think you talked about where your warehouse should be, whether it's close to your customers or importing and exporting. Um, and the question is, should should is it better that it's near the delivery point entry points when importing? Uh, so there are two thoughts on this. And historically, what we've always looked at is what we call as a supply network design. And so the question that's been posed here relates to two specific things. Uh, in terms of where you should have your warehouse, the idea would be to have where most of your volume is being shipped. Uh, so in some uh, markets and in some uh, situations, if all of your business is, call it 60% of your business is shipped in Johannesburg, it makes a lot of sense to have your biggest DC within Johannesburg, okay? So it really does depend on the business situation, but I would always suggest that based on where your biggest volume is being shipped, have your DC closer to that point. Now, if you are importing, uh, there's a few additional considerations you should take into account. Or does it make a lot more sense to have a cross stock thing? Can you hear me? I see the sound got lost again. Yeah, the sound got a little bit lost. If you can just start that question again. Yeah, sure. So, so on the on the point of where uh, whether you're importing, I think what's very important is to understand the cost of bringing a container or a truck or bringing that same uh, product. Durban port up to Johannesburg. And we, we usually in PNG look at three things. What is the cost of bringing that container up to Johannesburg? Okay, if we were to do nothing, what does it make sense to have what we call an offloading point in Durban, leave the container in Durban, and then bring the, the, the rest of your product into a normal truck, which may be cheaper and you may be able to fit more. 
And the third one is what you could do is you have a small satellite warehouse in Durban or in Cape Town or in any of the outlying regions that you service where you keep small amounts of inventory in each of those locations. But the key decision that you need to think about as you look through those three options is what is which of most of your volume? What's the size of the business that you have in those separate locations? And does it cost justify having those locations to servers? Because remember, as you have more inventory in each of those areas, you're going to need to have to validate the stock, have people to manage that stock, and you're going to pay the cost of offloading and double handling. So those are some of the considerations you need to take into account as you think about having different locations for where you store your way or your product. Okay, the addition to that was how does this differ if you're bringing in fresh produce or things that have a sell by? Well, I think the fresh produce will seem equally, if not more important, is the turn of that inventory or how quickly you have to do it, distribute it. So in most cases where you have uh, fresh produce, what we find in most of the industries that we're engaging is that on fresh produce, it's not going to be sitting in the warehouse for too long. So the idea would be to make sure it's just in time, spends very little time in your warehouse. And ideally, if you can even avoid having fresh produce sitting in your warehouse and go directly to the customer in the right packaging with the right quality, you're going to save yourself a significant amount of money and cost and people uh, cost to uh, by not having it touch your way a warehouse or distribution center. So ideally, the ideal uh, ideal flow for any supply chain would be from manufacturing directly to the customer because you bypass a lot of touches in the entire supply chain. If you cannot do that, then what you could do is at the point of manufacturing, you could have your warehouse right next to that site and then move it, especially on fresh produce, directly to the customer so that you don't have too much of distance in terms of traveling time and trucking cost. I hope that's a question. Um, yeah, I'll ask. And then uh, I think we should carry on, but I've got, I, there was another one just asked, if he has time, will he be able to just quickly talk us through the just-in-time formula? Is there a formula? Uh, I don't think there's going to be enough time to talk it through because you have to go through a, a whole sequence of uh, processes to establish it. But I'll, I'll cover the principles on how we think of it as PNG and the framework we talk about. So hopefully we can answer it. If there are more questions that we need to dig into the details, then I'm happy to do that at some point uh, later on. Okay. okay. I think so. So no, okay. okay, I'll continue. Uh, to a standard distribution and a warehouse center, okay? And today, but the idea is just to give you a standard picture of what a distribution center would look like, what are some of the key things you should see in a distribution center, and then as you think of your own warehouse or distribution center, what are the things you think you need to improve on, or what are the things you'd want to focus on as you think about driving cost out of the supply chain? So very simple in most warehouse or distribution centers, we all work on pallets. Okay. And pallets are a way of moving the product depending on the type of warehouse you have. If you don't, if you cannot afford to have a warehouse with racking, even then having pallets is still a great way of making sure that your product is kept safe, the right quality. Okay. But typically in South Africa, we have a pallet that uh, one meter by 1.2 meters. It's called a UK chip pallet. It's the most uh, widely used pallet within South Africa, and it does come at a cost. But the idea is to make sure that these costs help you drive to efficiencies in your warehouse. Okay. In terms, uh, depending on the type of warehouse, okay, depending on the location of your warehouse, you could have what you typically would see in South Africa. Okay, which is you have open doors, you have various uh, trucks and forklifts moving in and out. Uh, what we in PNG, because we have specific requirements from requirements from a quality standard point of view, we try to make sure that 
all our doors are always closed. We want to make sure that we have strong pest control in, on the parameters so that we make sure that we keep the quality of the product to its original state. So a typical dog door that you could find in a PNG site would be something like this. But this is not uncommon. It just really does depend on the site you're using and where you're based and what kind of uh, receiving doors your premises would have. All too often also in Europe, what you would also find is standard design, but again, it's available. I wanted to share it with you just so that you're aware of it. What you will find is what I share on the right over here, which is a normal dock door opens up, your containers can be received. And in some cases, if you don't have dock doors, you could have normal doors that open up just as and when the truck comes into your site. Normally what you would find is every dock door has a space between it, each other of around greater than four meters, just to enable you to have a truck reverse back, uh, depending on the type of vehicle you're using. In which is very common in South Africa, is what we call a superlink. It can load up to about 80 to 90 cubes worth of product into the truck. Uh, it is not common in Europe, uh, but side loading trucks are very common in South Africa. So what is important is, as you think about your vehicle types for your distribution, understand the size of the orders you're getting. How many trucks are you ordering? Uh, are you getting the customer to order the full of truck? Are you incentivizing to utilize that truck? Because the most important thing on, on any leg of your transportation is to maximize that truck. You want to make sure there's very little space in it because if there's little space, that means you're getting the full value of that truck. If there's space in your truck, you need to look at how you can best optimize it or incentivize your customers to improve what they put into that truck so that you maximize the load. Okay, uh, and in some markets, what we do find is wing doors. Uh, you get side load or double deckers, which have a platform in it, and then you get a typical pin track, which is basically rear loading trucks. Not very common in South Africa, but these two, uh, the super links in South Africa and the side loaded double decker, is quite common uh, in South Africa as you travel across the country. But it the equally important is how you move your product in your warehouse, okay? Depending on the type of the warehouse or distribution center that you have, these vehicles can drive efficiencies for you as you think of driving uh, costs up. Now, as you evolve through the supply chain and as your business evolves, there's a cost benefit assessment that you have to do, whether it makes sense still to have a, a very sophisticated pallet or lift truck for your storage or is there an alternate way depending on how you store your product is a critical component of what equipment you will use okay but the standard forklift or lift truck is very common in every png or in most uh, big distribution centers warehouses the supply chain uh, evolution uh, the pallet lift is very common it's very low cost However, it's not the most efficient way of moving through your warehouse because it does require a person, it does require a lot more time to move the same pallet versus a, a huge truck or pallet. Also, depending on how you want to move your product, there are different types of product uh, pallet, uh, pallet jacks okay, that are powered uh, for loading, unloading, transportation. These are very common today. And as you think of the future, and as we think about uh, Industry 4.0, which is really on the edge of digitization, we are finding in PNG, we're starting to look at automated guided vehicles, which is basically, you have a forklift, but there's no one on it, and it knows exactly where to go, how to go. The investment is quite big in these cases, where you have these very advanced uh, technology, but over the next 12 to 18 months, we expect that this cost will go down over a period of time. Again, the end in mind, if you look at all of what we've talked so far, is how do I have the few less, less touches, few people making sure it's digitized as much as I can, reduce the amount of waiting time, and making sure whatever assets or tools you do have is there to reduce the time and cost in your warehouse.
any of you have seen some videos about Amazon or any of the big e-commerce players out there, uh, they have moved to these types of goods to pick the automation, which is basically you have a robot that is able to pick up a pallet, bring it to you before you offload it. It then goes through your entire warehouse without having any individuals working on it. It has a payload, okay, it's just essentially how much can it take on one specific robot and how much of weight can it move. And this is the future. This is how we drive future productivity when you look at the big, big warehouse distribution centers, this is how they're fast tracking the evolution of people and also making sure that robot efficiency is 24 seven, okay? They in South Africa and across the world are still using floor storage, okay? While it's not ideal, uh, it is the most least in terms of cost and low tech, but it also doesn't utilize your space very well. Depending on the type of product you're holding and storing, uh, it doesn't really help you in terms of optimizing your warehousing space, but it is very commonly used and it, there's nothing wrong with it if it serves the business need and serves your cost structure. Yeah. The warehouse, and if you do have a distribution stretch warehouse where you do have racks, the most commonly used rack today is what we call a single selective rack, which means basically if you look at the picture, it is really one product in that specific location, okay? And depending on the type of racking you have, it will determine how much of product is stored on that specific location. And as you think about the types of warehousing and the storage locations you have, we usually talk about storage lot sizes, okay? And storage lot sizes are usually dependent on the number of products or the quantity of products produced for that specific batch, okay? And in most cases, in a single lot a selector uh, rack, you can only fit one lot size, okay? Uh, and it will be broken down depending on how much you produced on that one specific batch. It could be you have, it could, if it was four that you produced in one inventory lot size, it would be stored in four different locations, okay? So lot sizes are important as you think of floor storage because it will determine how high and how deep you have to go as you need to store your product. Now, as we evolve, uh, as we look to drive more and more automation through the overall supply chain and in your warehouse, more and more we are seeing the introduction of conveyor belts. Why? Because we want to make sure that we are efficient moving products as quickly as possible from one end to the other. And in some cases, we are even looking at how to automate them so that as they come in, they get onto an automated rack and then they move out. Now, again, as I said, this really does depend on the type and where you are, uh, type of warehouse you have, and where you are in your supply chain evolution, but it's still okay and very commonly used today in South Africa that you have a truck that comes to your back door on the on pig and you offload it with people and it gets staged and then it gets moved by people. This sharing with you as you think of the evolution of what you need to think of on in the future as you look at your warehouse or distribution centers. Uh, one more, one more to see if there's any questions before we move on to a section relating to critical KPIs that you need to be measuring in your warehouse. Okay, thanks for that. That's very informative. Um, a few questions. Um, one of them is you talked about not having, having your trucks full. Are there companies that allow you to share trucks or software that you're aware of that does that? Uh, so two uh, answers to the question. One, they are companies that will help you. Uh, we call them, we call them uh, co-loading companies, okay? Uh, and as we think about them, you could go into what we call transshipment point where you get vehicles and loads consolidated to help you maximize uh, that specific load to a specific location. And that's in South Africa as well. They exist here too. 
that's correct Shane. so so we we you do have those companies in south africa uh the big 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 players will be able to help any of the parties but most of the courier companies also understand so when we deliver to stores uh we cannot obviously deliver to five thousand or six thousand stores so most likely we get into big customers distribution centers or we get involved with a which allows them to consolidate multiple loads into one truck. Uh, the second question, which I did not answer was, are there tools and softwares available? There are tools and software available to help you uh, maximize your loads, uh, but it can be as simple as a simple Excel document. And what really is needed for that is to understand the, di the dimensions of your product. So as you think about the product, how much is going for the pallet? How much of what's the dimension, what's the cubic dimensions of each of your pallets or each of your products. And as you build a load, you should be able to be clear on how big your truck is in terms of cubes, including the pallet, and then say to your customers, okay, uh, on this specific eight ton truck, I can only load at best three or four cubes, uh, but we know that you, you're underutilizing that truck because, uh, by at least five or six cubes maybe. So those are the, that's how you need to think about how you maximize your loads, is understand the vehicle type, understand the cubes that could fall into that vehicle type. Once you understand that, then break down your portfolio into cubes and say, okay, based on the orders that are in the last, call it 12, six months, what are the typical usage have I had on a specific order in terms of cubes? And then you can build on that to deliver a specific truck-based cube for uh, two. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then the last question, the la the last question I've got is about um, you talked about the impact of 4.0. Where do you think there are opportunities for women business owners in the warehousing and logistics industry? So I, I think on, on, on this uh, for industry 4.0, I think the biggest opportunity today lies in. Uh, we're going to need to be a lot more agile. So if you have the infrastructure uh, already set up across the country, let's take South Africa, uh, because most of the people are big sites as what we call transship points or proccing points. Uh, this allows them to bring product to your DC, offload it, and then utilize your site to move on product to another location. So I think depending on the infrastructure, that will be one. Uh, I think uh, someone said they got cut off. Let me just repeat the point. Uh, so on industry 4.0, I think what's important is to understand what infrastructure you have, uh, what can you offer to the big corporates, because we're all looking at how we can be as agile as possible. Uh, a good example today, uh, not that we're using it today in South Africa, but we have used it in other markets, is uh, in some cases we have a container that is half utilized. So what we could do is go to a non-compete like a Nike and say, okay, we as PNG will load the bottom level. Can you load the same container with Nike product on them? And so we maximize the load of that container. Very relevant and very important as you think about how you import, but it's the same thing as uh, if you were locally producing, as you look to ship and move your trucks across the supply chain, if you can find that synergies between a non-compete and yourself to utilize your trucks better, it's a great of uh, driving industry 4.0 because one, there's less kilometers of those trucks on the, uh, on that on that route. You're going to help with the carbon footprint, and it has a big impo impact on carbon uh, on the carbon footprint. And it's a great way of driving sustainability for your supply chain. Great. Um, before you carry on, let me just say, anybody on the call you want to add questions, please just type in the chat. Uh, majority of people are sending them to my WhatsApp, but please put them in the in the chat, please, below, and we'll keep picking them up. Great. Thank, thank you. Please continue, Michelle. Super. So let's continue. So as you think about your warehouse or distribution center, there are some key measures that I think are critical in any site, independent of the size of the site, 
independent of the work you do okay and w these are key to always have at top of mind because they are key matrices that impact your cost your cash and your service and your quality and on top of that safety okay so these are some kpis that you should have and put in place in your respective sites so the obvious ones on volume is how many cases do i ship per day how many cases do i receive how many cases am i picking uh, as a full pallet or how many items am i picking on a day-to-day -day basis because that's going to be a good indicator of the amount of people that you need at any one point in time in your site then cost okay as you think about the cost what does it cost me to store that product what does it cost me to handle the product and store and handling is both for inbound and outbound so how much does it cost me to offload a specific truck how many people are involved to offload that truck and once i have it staged okay what does it cost for me to move it from my staging into my storage location okay as you think about handling the next phase is okay how much does it cost me to pick one order uh, as you think about on your outbound leg uh, what does it cost for me to take that product and stage it for outbound okay these are the various levels of handling across the the, the order processing cycle and receiving cycle that you need to be aware of and have a good understanding of because that's the one way you're going to drive cost and inventory okay in, in an environment today where cash is king uh, and the your it's equally important to make sure you have the right inventory at the right time and how do you make sure you do that make sure you have a good understanding of your order patterns Make sure you have a good understanding of your forecast. Make sure you are not holding any any non-productive inventory, i.e. anything that's going to expire. Make sure you scrap those. Anything that has been sitting dead stock, identify opportunities for you to sell that dead stock. Because the more you make sure you have a productive inventory, the better it is for your overall business. Productivity. How many people do you have at any one point in time in your warehouse or in your distribution center? Or what does it cost for you to have them there? How often are they? How often are you utilizing them? Are they used the entire day? What are the core tasks? These are all important productivity measures that you need to be able to understand as you think about managing your cost and warehousing and distribution centers. Then damages, okay? damages is lost money for you so you really need to understand what's causing those damages why are you getting those damages where are you getting the damages is there something you can make as an intervention to help with those damages these are the important because you can then understand of the inventory or holding how much and what percentage of it is being damaged and written off as you go to service service is really really a key differentiator between you and the next individual so servicing your clients and customers to the best of your ability is critical. So you need to understand which order came in and was it shipped on time? How long did a truck come from the gate time it came into my gate until it left the gate? How long did it take? Because the longer you hold the truck, the more standing cost you're going to have. So you need to understand and track gate in time, offloading time, gate out time when did it arrive at the customer how long did it wait at the customer these are all things as you think about your supply chain and your warehouse that you need to be measuring uh, picking accuracy why is picking accuracy important because you don't want to touch the order two times right so basically the first time you pick it it needs to be right the first time because else you're going to have to get someone else to go and correct that mistake so picking accuracy very very important as you look to stage your product before it goes out okay inventory record accuracy inventory record access accuracy in png is one of the most critical controls we have and why is that because it tells us how accurate our system information is versus what is on the actual floor okay uh, and we do two or three checks uh, at least two to three times a day in our warehouse uh, we are checking the system to the floor Okay, so we always make sure that in our case we have, uh, in our in our case we have uh, a, a third party vendor that is managing our distribution center. So we check: does our system match to their system? Does their system match to the floor? Okay. Then what we are checking is in each and every pallet location, is the right product in the right location? 
Is the quality of that product correct? Is the quantity correct? Is the batch number correct? Is the status of that product in the right location? Why are these important? Because they're critical to make sure that you have a good understanding of what is in your warehouse at any one point in time. As you think about it, on the far right, we're focused on quality and safety. You need to make sure you track all your safety incidents, okay? Any near misses, any incidents where people got hurt on your site is critical because you want to make sure that you take care of the people that are managing your site. Any quality incidents, quality incidents could be spillages, uh, any breakages, uh, any damages on receiving or on receiving of your product or moving of your product or even as you load it into a truck. Do you have a good understanding of what does quality assurance look like and the capability needed for your site? And then last but not least, as we mentioned, which is a duplicate over here, safety incident percentages versus the total hours you have in your site are quite important because you want to make sure you limit the amount of downtime in the event that someone gets hurt. Okay. So with that, uh, we would have covered everything uh, pretty much today on what are the key fundamentals of the warehousing, uh, what are the different types of uh, equipment you have in warehousing, and then what are the core key performance indicators that you need to have in place as you think about your warehouse and distribution centers. Uh, with that, I'm just going to pause to see are there any new questions uh, so that we can answer them. We do have quite a bit of time still, so we have another 15 minutes, so happy to take any questions uh, during that period. Okay, um, again, a question that's come directly to me around pricing. Um, the question is, there are quite a few opportunities on importing cheaper products from elsewhere, but I'm always stuck in how to price them, and I have to consider import costs, warehousing, and transport. Is there some ideas you can give on how we handle this? Yeah, sure. So uh, so in a typical business, uh, you're right, it's quite complicated because once you add up all the costs, you need to understand what is the final price. So what I would do is take it into chunks, okay? So the first chunk is, okay, what does it cost you to import that product up to, say, Durban? Okay, so what's the price of that? Then I would take the next leg is, okay, for me to transport it from Durban to Johannesburg, what is the cost of that transportation? And separate them into legs. So the import cost cost is one element. The transportation cost is the next element to your warehouse center. Then once it gets into your warehousing, as we talked earlier, you need to understand what does it cost you to move one single pallet or one single case or item through your warehouse. Because once you have that all costed out, you will then be able to say, okay, for the total cost end to end for one single product to flow through my entire supply chain is going to be Y. And in some companies, they call it total cost, total delivered cost, total, um, uh, it depends on the industry you're in, but that's the way we would look at it and we'll walk the flow of the, of the product to get a good idea of how to cost things. Uh, and the best way is to do it by buckets because then you'll be able to very clearly articulate what are the different cost buckets which are fixed? The other element that you need to also understand is as you do, do look at your costing, understand which costs are fixed and which are variable. Okay. So for instance, if you have a lease which is tied up for your warehouse for six months, that cost is fixed. You're not going to be able to change it. Okay. But in some cases, maybe you don't have a warehouse, but you're renting out space from a site that is utilized by a number of other players, you can may be only paying for the usage of that specific pallet. And then you could be paying per day rates on the pallet usage. So those are the, as you think about the cost packets, that's how we would break it down to really get to the granular detail of how you move the product to the supply chain. Okay, another related to that question, um... It says, um, she would appreciate assistance with the costing of these as she's only only used labor as part of our costing, but you've talked about systems, e.g. SAP. Um, so cost of picking, how do you calculate? Uh, 
and and the scanning devices how would you how do you calculate sure so so if i look at the systems right so if, uh, bear in mind that this is a uh, typical in png we have sap so it's a very expensive uh, big monster uh, but in most most cases not everyone can afford managed system or interface into SAP. So I think what you could do is really simplify your life by first understanding, okay, what do I spend all my money on on the day-to-day -day basis in terms of the warehouse? So in most cases, there are a few things that you would spend uh, on a warehouse. Uh, your lease, depending of whether you own the lease or not, okay? Uh, your utilities, and then it's your people. Okay. And depending on the number of people and the number of ships you are working, that those will be all inputs into the cost of your product. And the way you get to the cost of the product is taking those costs, aggregate them, look at how much you you invoiced out and how much all you shipped out, okay, out of your warehouse, and that's going to give you a cost per product. Now, obviously, within that, you then need to say, okay, how much of this is fixed, how much is variable, depending on how much you ship on any given month. These costs will vary, but you need to create a budget, basically, like you would do for your household expenses. You would do the same for the warehouse. You would look at the various buckets where you spend your money, aggregate them, and look at, okay, what does it cost for you to move that product into your warehouse? I hope I answered the question. It is not an easy question to answer because you really need to take the case by case, and you need to go into the walking of the flow of the warehousing and the product to be able to look at what are the costs you're paying but broadly those are the buckets we look at for the warehousing and then obviously in some cases we have permanent people and we also have uh, temporary staff so depending on where we are in which part of the the cycle of the business we would fluctuate our number of people we need on site depending on the business requirements but as i said your the the, uh, the tools you use does not need to be exactly to what i shared look and identify tools that make sense for what you're doing today and how can you best utilize it for the business need. Uh, in some cases, in some sites very long ago, we were still doing manual picking. Okay, So it's not impossible to do. It just requires the right level of rigor as you think about how you manage your facility. Okay, um, I'm hoping she'll come online and clarify if you've answered her question. And then the, the last question I've got so far is about how do uh, service providers join um, PNG supply chain? And I'm not sure if Nick helps back. That was the last question. Uh, I'm not sure if Mikael is on the line, but uh, if he isn't, my, my suggestion would be to get hold of Mikael because he's our purchasing contact. And then you'll go through a standard process of setting up vendors. And then depending on the service you offer, uh, we would then look at how we can best engage with you uh, for any other opportunities we have uh, within our supply chain. Uh, hi, Jean. I'm, I am back. Uh, can you just repeat the question for me, please? Uh, it was just basically about how do they join, how do they become a supplier? I see. Um, so the process that PNG follows, uh, we don't register anyone upfront. Uh, if we do register businesses upfront or suppliers upfront and don't use them within a certain time period, um, it's all managed and viewed by a central team in Manila. And if they see no activity with a certain vendor that's been registered, it gets blocked off for future interaction for a certain period of time. So we register businesses and bring suppliers onto our supply base um, based on a business need basis. So if there's a business need that we have and one that has been common lately um, would be PPE and masks and sanitizers and things like that. We will reach out to supplier networks that we have, like WeConnect, and we will send out a request for proposal or request for quotation. Um, we reach out to Gene on some of these things recently, and basically we reach out to say what we need, and WeConnect will then reach out to all of you to say that PNG is currently looking for this particular item or this particular service. 
and put forward a proposal which we will then view. Um, if it all works out, then we register you on the supply base. Thanks, Mikhail. And then another question that's just come in, um, Harshal, has COVID-19 made PNG want to manufacture more products locally? And can you say what percentage of your products are manufactured locally? As in yeah, sure. So, I mean, uh, I've been in the company now 18 years and we've evolved the the amount of local production significantly. So today we have, uh, depending on the category, we have anywhere between 60 to 70 percent uh, produced locally. Uh, and then thereafter, uh, we still import. But the, the, there is a, always an evaluation that always needs to take place on whether it's cost justified to continue and do we have the scale to justify it. So the key is let's understand we, we're always open to local production. We see value in it, uh, but it obviously needs to make business sense for us. Uh, so, yeah, we'll continue to evaluate as we go through the COVID-19 cycle. We, what it has taught us, and to touch on the point, is uh, your supply chain resilience is very critical. So what does that mean? It means, do you have strong business continuity plans? Have you tested your business continuity plans? Do you have the right structure in place to manage those continuity plans? Uh, it, that's critical as you think about uh, COVID-19 and how to adapt. Uh, if I recall correctly, Jean, there was a question also on just-in-time. Uh, so just-in-time is a a very common principle that you find across the many uh, matrices in the supply chain. It's really about how do you enable it and what are the key elements that you need to put in place to enable it. Uh, so uh, just in time is dependent on your cycle and what are the tools and capabilities you have in your supply chain. Uh, and if you think about it, just in time was developed really to think about how you streamline your impact on cost, cash, and service, okay? And I say this, you only get the product as and when you need it, not anytime sooner, not anytime later. Uh, an alternative to that, and a, a, a very well-documented book is uh, theory of constraints. Equally important, equally relevant, and it's all about walking through your supply chain and looking at how do you enable all of the touches to be as small as possible, just as and when your demand is required? Great. Um, yeah, that question was repeated here. And then somebody else says, uh, PNG, can we have access to your market demand strategy? Uh, I, th I think there's a bit of uh, confidentiality involved in that. So we need to obviously understand what would you like to achieve? Uh, and we can certainly give you some guidance. Obviously, the, there's these, the go to market strategies we have in place for PNG are quite specific and confidential. So we're not able to share them, but we can certainly give you some of the key guidelines and frameworks that you need to have in place as you think about your go to market strategies. Great. Um, those are the last questions I had on my side. I don't know if it ladies on the call, if there's anybody else who wanted to add anything, any questions. Uh, thank you for covering the just in time. That was great. Uh, we missed that out. And just to let everybody know, um, we will share the slides with you um and the recording will go onto the we connect platform and then we'll share the link of that as well um Mikhail, i don't know if there's anything you wanted to add and then i'll hand over to partial to do any closing remarks and then i'll just say thank you and we should be just in time great thanks jean and um again thank partial for taking the time to participate in this training uh, or to lead this training and webinar session. I'm um, sure it was a lot of good, great takeaways for the ladies on the call. Cool. Uh, I, I think uh, some closing remarks from my end to the, the group on the call is uh, the best way to understand uh, whether you can cut costs or reduce costs in any supply chain is to walk it. 
the, and the importance of walking your supply chain is critical. Walk it, walk it, walk it, because as you walk through the supply chain, you're going to find a lot of losses in the supply chain. Make sure you understand why you people are doing certain things the way they're doing. And then don't be afraid to ask a lot of questions and get into the details because the devil is in the details, especially as you think about costing your product. You want to make sure you understand end to end how you synchronize your supply chain so that you make sure that you reduce your cost, reduce the cash you're holding, but still delivering the right service at the right time with the right quality. Uh, so that's all for me i really do appreciate everyone's time and uh, the questions and feel free to reach out to me i'm always available thank you very much